Well, John, we are at two o'clock. And uh, so if you are ready to go, we're ready to listen. Oh, I am. Thank you. It's so good to see all of you and to talk about Italian food, which has really pretty been, been a fun month for me of working with the Italian cuisine that I grew up with. And you say, what? I thought you lived in Kansas City. I did. I did. I grew up right up here by the airport. And um, and we had, and I think the best restaurant in the Northland as I was growing up was Casconi's, and it's still going to this day. And I also went to school at UMKC and just, and I lived in a dorm at 51st and Cherry and just down 51st Street at Maine was a very, very uh, legitimate Italian, classic Italian restaurant. We couldn't afford to go over there very often. My roommate and I, a pizza was a, a week's worth of uh, saving and scrimping. Uh, it was expensive, but it was a fabulous experience. That was a great Italian restaurant. There is an Italian restaurant at 51st in Maine to this day, but it's uh, re it's recently opened. I don't, I, the, it looks familiar. And, and and so maybe it's in the very same facility that I, that I ate in back in the, in the 60s. And then, and then there was the Italian garden uh, downtown, which was, I, I went there for a prom night. I, I mean, if I thought about fine dining when I was a kid, it was Italian. And so um, many years later, I was living in Germany and they, and they do this in, in German towns where there are a large number of guest workers they have restaurants built that cater to those guest workers. And of course, there are a lot of Italian guest workers in the Bavarian town that I lived in. And, and, and all the Germans, if they didn't eat in German restaurant, ate in that Italian restaurant. It was very, very good, very legitimate. I didn't ever get to Italy in all the years that we lived in Germany. We lived 90 miles north of Munich and, you know, Milan was about a 10 hour drive, very expensive. And of course you couldn't get there uh, in the, through the winter season because of the Alps. Hannibal and I had the same problem with getting to Italy. <laughs> the Alps are impenetrable, <laughs> unless you have an elephant, I guess. But uh, so as close as we were to Italy, we never could get there for time distance reasons and expense. You could fly. That was not just, you know, a vacation for me. Uh, we just couldn't afford Italian uh, vacation. So never to get there. But I, because of my, because of my uh, experiences when I was a kid in legitimate and really fine dining Italian restaurants and then in Germany in uh, much more uh, casual, but excellent Italian restaurants. I, I think I know something about what Italian food ought to cook like, so uh, taste like. So I set about going back and doing all, doing all these Italian pasta and pizza recipes with the new with the, the new ingredients, the ingredients that are available to me through you know high V and aisles. Um, and so I, I did that. So let, let's next slide, please. Let's just jump right into some of the ingredients. Italian sausage is a thing. I'm I'm not recommending this brand particularly. You'll have to try it if you like it. It is chicken. It is a smooth texture. It is pre-cooked. And I think it's delicious. And it and I, I just don't think you can do better than this uh, for, uh, for an Italian sausage as an ingredient in things like I put it in calzone uh, today. And, and, uh, and I like this one. The Johnsonville Italian sausages are very, very high in fat. And to me, um, they really are, they are, they shrink so much. They're, 
they're good. And if you want, uh, if you if you like their flavor, fine. There, there's nothing wrong with it. You have a choice between hot and mild and all Italian sausages pretty well. And that's a that's a personal thing. And you have a choice on the kinds of casings that the sausages come in. Very high end sausages are going to be in a natural casing. Uh, if you're just going to peel it for, and and have and and crumb and you know cook it and crumble it over pizzas or whatever, I recommend that you buy the Italian sausage raw Italian sausage mix that they have uh, in the meat markets. So I recommend that. Uh, but wow, it's hard to beat Adele's chicken. I like it a lot. Go ahead, please. Go ahead, please, Jonathan. Uh, a little technical difficulty. Give me one second here. Oh no, no hurry. Get back where no I need to be. So, uh, so anyway, I, I, I like the I like the Adele's product. All of their products. They have a whole line of all the sausages. As far as fresh herbs go, I um, my daughter has uh, one of those light lighted garden things that she and, and uh, every time I'm around it I I, I think eh, well, I'd like that I'd like to do that I'd like to have fresh herbs but these are too handy these Giselle's um, uh, little pots of uh, of the fresh herbs they last a long time they just sit on the kitchen table for me and, and add a little water to them every once in a while if they get a little sun they're fine, and 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 I I have one that's about three weeks old uh, in there, and it just does great because fresh basil is wonderful, absolutely a wonderful herb. I love it more than any other. I think all the other herbs uh, that are, would be fresh that I would grow here, I would not use nearly as much. But I, I could put basil on my Cheerios. It's just that good. And I can hardly wait, of course, to get tomatoes, fresh tomatoes, to have the fresh basil with, uh, with the summer tomatoes. That is just my favorite, favorite uh, salad. And I use a lot of fresh herbs, uh, a lot of fresh basil this week, but I also used an Italian herb mix. I told you I got herbs for Christmas. And again, I've forgotten the name of the of the company. It, the is anyway. It's I have a whole new herb uh, uh, carousel full of the, these wonderful herbs, and they have an Italian herb mix in there that is just uh, the best I've ever had. But you can make your own, of course, with oregano, basil, and thyme leaves, not ground, and that's a great Italian herb mix. Um, but if you get a chance to use fresh basil, do that every time a, 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 something calls for basil. Just remember to put it in at the very last, right before. And in fact, don't even put it in before you cook it. Uh, put it in uh, on the on the plate, uh, as you see I do. Uh, fresh, it turns black when you when you cook it. So, okay, next slide, please. Uh, there we go. Okay, garlic. I um, I have never owned a garlic press. Here is the one that the Test Kitchen recommends. It's forty five dollars. It takes a lot of hand strength, a lot of hand strength to press a gar garlic clove through there. Because certainly have to peel a garlic. I read a review of this the other day, and some guy said he thought you could just put a clove of garlic in one of these presses, unpeel. Well, of course you can't. You have to peel it, and then um, and you get a very very fine mince and a uniform mince, and that's all fine and well. I've just never had one. I, uh, professionals don't use them because they go through so much garlic. They buy peel garlic usually, and I love to chop garlic. So it to me is just snip off the end, hit it with a this flat of the uh, of the knife. It peels itself, and then it, mincing it is very quick and easy, and that's what I do every time I use fresh garlic. I just don't have a garlic press, but there is that one, and if you use garlic every day, 
I, I'm sure you have one of these. And that's, that model is the one that is uh, highly recommended. It is stainless steel. I wouldn't put it in a dishwasher, but but it, it cleans up uh, quickly and easily. And if you have the hand strength and you peel a lot of garlic and mince it, well, there you go. I just never have had one. I do want to remind you to not over brown garlic. If you have garlic mince, like if you're doing some uh, mushrooms or something and you and you get the oil, I mean, get the butter bubbling and you add the garlic, don't want to go too long there because that's that will change the flavor in in, in a bad way. Uh, so think of sweating something, just simmering it or infusing the the garlic flavor into the oil rather than a lot of heat. And and now, Garlic comes in really, really strong and harsh if it's added at the last and doesn't have a chance to uh, to, to to brown slightly. It, it, it's harsh and it's not a good uh, not a good addition. And so the best thing to do uh, if you have garlic on your menu all the time, every day, is to roast it. And you saw. Go ahead uh, to the next slide, please, Jonathan. You saw in um, when I talked about um, uh, Mexican rice, the technique for browning jalapenos and browning garlic, browning garlic, unpeeled garlic in a hot cast iron skillet, and you just keep turning it and turning it, and, and, and in just five, in 10 minutes or so, it turns brown, nicely soft, and, and so forth. But to develop the full flavor of roasted garlic, here's a technique to do it. Cut the top of the, of the garlic off, expose it, put a bunch of them in a little pouch of aluminum foil, drizzle some oil over it and put it in the oven. And for after a long time in a, in a hot oven, say an hour and a half, then when you take it out, it will have browned and softened and you can just squeeze it out of the skin and then you can store it in the refrigerator for a week or freeze it and portion it and freeze it. So that's, that's, a, that's a good do ahead note. I, I would not fire up my, uh, my big oven to, to roast six garlic heads. <laughs> uh, that just seems so wasteful to me. So if, when I do this, I just throw a head of garlic in with something else that's roasting, like the lasagna or something that's, I mean, that's baking in the oven. So I, I wouldn't. But if you, if you really do love garlic, roast it. It's, it's wonderful. Just wonderful. Go ahead, please. Now, as far as lasagna for, for, uh, the noodles for lasagna, even though your, your brand of lasagna noodles might not say oven ready, they are all oven ready. The difference between this lasagna that says oven ready and the other is this is a little thinner, but treated with a lot of moisture, you don't ever need to do that process of boiling your lasagna noodles. Just let the lasagna liquid uh, cook your lasagna noodles. So don't, don't take that extra step. I wanna talk about lasagna, to the top of lasagna because you'll have problems with the top of lasagna, the noodles curling up, getting out of the liquid, and then then they won't be they won't be soft. So uh, we'll have to watch that. I'll talk about that a little bit later. But anyway, uh, lasagna noodles are there's nothing special about them. They don't need to be curly on the edge. They don't need to be cooked ahead of time. You just need to have enough liquid in there so that they get so that they get cooked. Uh, and so. Uh, next next slide, uh, please. Extra virgin olive oil. I went through a whole bottle. This was a Christmas gift uh, to me from the Tasteful Olive. It is this Arbaquinha, which is a very ancient tree. This these olives came from a from very ancient trees. Doesn't necessarily be in 
Italy. It could have been in California. It doesn't say. Um, but anyway, that's the tree that the olives came from. Uh, and it's very, it was very nice. I, I enjoyed it thoroughly. It costs an arm and a leg. <laughs> it was a crisp. I was in my Christmas stocking. And I went through the whole bottle cooking all of these recipes. And I I enjoyed it. I've got to say it was very nice. And I love going to the Tasteful Olive. I haven't been now since uh, COVID, but I love to go to the Tasteful Olive and taste those olive oils and come home with a bottle of expensive olive oil. But the test kitchen says that this one, this is this is very inexpensive. This is Bertoli. And it, it's it's made in Italy. There's a controversy about that because the olives are not necessarily made in Italy. They bring the olives in from all over the Middle East, the Mid, Mid, Mediterranean. Uh, but nevertheless, it's it's good. It's really good. And it, to me, the uh, expense and the inconvenience of going to the tasteful olive, as much as I love the tasteful olive. Uh, is is something I say for holidays. I, I hope my kids uh, give it to me for Christmas because this is my go-to everyday olive oil and it's very good and it's very reasonably priced, always available on the grocery store shelf. So there you go. Olive oils taste like a rainbow of flavors. There's some olive oils that are just so palate and no flavor. And some of them are so overwhelming. I mean, you really do have to, uh, you have to love olive oil to buy some of those really strongly flavored ones. They're too strong for me. Okay. I got to get on here. Now, L Lydia, Lydia's is a surprising restaurant. I don't know if you've eaten in Lydia's recently or not, or, or if you were as surprised as we were when well, how long has she been there now? 20 years or more. Um, I was very surprised when I took my family to Lydia's and found out that it was Northern Italian cuisine. In fact, uh, my, I mean, really didn't, wasn't the American Italian cuisine that we were expecting at all. Quite different cuisine, but I do love her cuisine and I love her cooking and I look, and she now has just, made Italian cuisine so, so elegant. And, uh, and I love her for that. Her, her style of marinara sauce is with these San Marzano tomatoes. I don't think ever in my life I ever spent $7 for a can of tomatoes, but that's what this costs. And uh, the, the tomato in of San Marzano in a can of San Marzano tomatoes don't, the tomatoes don't vary. They're all the same. And it, and the label doesn't make the tomatoes better than they're all, if it says San Marzano, they're all the same tomato. They all taste the same to my taste. But many of them have a lot of processing. This one has uh, tomato paste added to it and basil and all kinds of flavorings. You just take it out of the can and puree it and it's good enough for Lydia. So uh, read the label carefully. If you do not want the flavorings, then buy San Marzano tomatoes that just say peel tomatoes and and look at the label and see see if they've added any ingredients. This is a has a lot of processing to it, but it's delicious. Oh boy! All you have to do add some garlic, add some basil. Well, you don't even have to add basil to this one. It's it's already got it in there. This is a wonderful product, and it will change overnight your spaghetti and meatballs, your pizza. Just using these tomatoes alone will make your Italian cuisine excellent. I believe. So go ahead, go ahead, please. Uh, cooking pasta is uh, is difficult, and it is especially difficult if you use this Italian uh, pasta from Char because it's about this long. It's huge. It's so long you can't. You'd have to have a pot, uh, a five gallon 
pot of boiling water in order to get the pasta down in there in in a couple of minutes you you can get it bent but it's just very difficult because it's so doggone long and so what i had to do to cook this pasta was i got a big a giant the biggest pan i have that's wide and shallow so i could get the pasta all into the boiling liquid at the same time. It was a problem. It was a problem getting this, this pasta done because it was so long. So, and as I've told you all before, uh, oiling the pasta water is a waste of oil. Oh my gosh, it would be extravagantly wasteful to put extra virgin olive oil in the boiling water that is just going to it, it's not going to have any effect in the cooking of the pasta and the, you're just going to pour it down the drain when you drain it out. So I, I don't recommend uh, putting oil in your pasta water. I do recommend having a lot of water so that the temperature stays up there and that you just, as you get close to the al dente that you like, uh, that you are able to get it out of the water quickly and all at the same time, so all the pasta's done the same. And then, as it drains, then add the oil there to keep it from from sticking. And um, don't 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 if you put the pasta back in the empty pan to hold it and put a lid on top of it to hold it warm. The pasta, nothing good is going to happen to that pasta. It, it's, I don't recommend doing that at all. If you are going, there's a long time between the time you cook the pasta and the time you serve the pasta, then just let it go to room temperature oiled. Don't cover it. It will keep cooking. Just let it go to room temperature. And in the meantime, start a pan of water. If you drained out the water, then start another pan of water so it's warm. And then just, just by, by each service portion, warm it up in the hot water, drain it quickly in a colander, and then put it, put it on a plate. But don't try to hold it warm for a long time or it'll go mushy, it'll stick together, and you won't like the texture of your pasta. So not enough about that. Go ahead, please. Now, Italian meatballs. I, I, I know I've, I've done these. I bought them pre-made. I've made them. I've in the last last year, I've been through several different brands of pre-made ones, and then I've been through several different recipes. I found a good one. This works, and this is a very simple process too. Where meatballs might take a whole weekend if you go through the whole process. Uh, this is a one pot method where your sauce and your meatballs cook together and, and it was really, really great. The panade, the thing that sticks them together is, in my case, was panko and it just worked beautifully. The texture of them was terrific. But the test kitchen uses saltine crackers, breaks break up the saltine crackers roll in a in a Ziploc bag and you add those about a cup to a pound of beef and uh, that that was very good I used the I used the panko but their step is to hydrate those saltine crackers and I I hydrated my panko and they were terrific and this, this meatball recipe, I've included it on the on the rest in the recipe packet. This is a hundred percent beef, eighty five percent fat, uh, lean, and and um, it has some parmesan in it. And they're quickly formed. You don't have to brown them in the oven as an additional step. They cook in the sauce. They really flavor the sauce well. This is a great. Do it yourself on a weeknight for two meatball and spaghetti. Excellent, excellent. I, I just so pleased to have found this because I have been fumbling with meatballs until I found this process, which is just ground beef. No, no uh, pork uh, added. I, I like this a lot. I enjoyed this recipe. I think you will too. 
Uh, and I'll show you that I, I've done it with spaghetti, uh, but I found that it is even better with linguine. And, and next uh, down the road here, I'm going to talk about linguine and uh, fettuccine, rather. Now, everybody loves Alfredo sauce, but nobody loves heavy cream. <laughs> And so I did this. I have I have decided that I don't need all of that heavy cream. And I, in fact, go with two portions of milk to one portion of heavy cream. I cut the heavy cream content of my Alfredo sauce by a whole third. A cup of cream makes three cups of Alfredo sauce. And it's nothing more than just First, starting with, I love to start with dry vermouth. I reduce dry vermouth. Remember the roasted garlic? Well, here's where it really does a wonderful job. You just put some of that, squeeze some of that roasted garlic into that vermouth, let the vermouth reduce a little bit. It, 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 it has a wonderful perfume. It infuses the garlic flavor into the vermouth. You reduce that down to a few tablespoons, pretty, pretty dry. And take that roasted garlic out if you don't like that, you want to, want to see that in your sauce. Uh, then add the milk and cream and reduce that. Uh, once you get it to the, the texture that you like, coating the back of the spoon, that's in that bay. Uh, once it coats the back of the spoon, then you add the Parmesan and put it on the hot pasta and and of course, if you have some shrimp to saute in garlic, uh, that would make a very, very fine uh, meal of uh, Alfredo and um, light, much lighter than, than normal. So add milk to your heavy cream and reduce it. If you don't find it reducing, uh, thickening enough, there's nothing wrong with a little bit of cornstarch in there to give it the texture that you want. You'll have the wonderful flavor from the garlic and from the vermouth and from the Parmesan. And so don't mind at all adding a little bit of cornstarch to get your Alfredo, the thickness that you like, that you would, that you would get if you used 100% cream, but you can also get it too thick uh, if it's heavy cream, it, as you see there, that uh, that's uh, was chilled and I was reheating it, and it, it was uh, it would you could stick a spoon in it and it would stand up, and that's not the texture that you want at all for your Alfredo sauce. You want it to nappe, you want it to coat the back of the spoon. So there you go. Uh, linguine with shrimp scampi. Now this is a wonderful dish. It doesn't have I don't have a recipe for it. I just tell you, oh, if you've got some garlic and you've got some fresh parsley and some olive oil shrimp to quickly saute, and you've got some really great, great Parmesan cheese, cooking those shrimp in a garlicky oil and then with the fresh herbs, that's all the sauce you need. That is just a wonderful dish. If your pasta is, is just perfectly cooked, and you have the excellent olive oil uh, flavor, garlic flavor, parsley, uh, and uh, the shrimp. Oh, that, that is such a wonderful, quick and easy dish. If every single product is top drawer, highest quality, how, how could a meal be more satisfying than shrimp scampi? Um, so next slide, pizza dough. And this is, this is something you say, I don't make pizza dough. I, why make pizza dough? That's crazy. Um, and there are excellent frozen pizzas. Don't get me wrong. Oh boy, they're excellent. And put excellent toppings on, on an excellent frozen pizza. It's great. But this dough, and it comes my my favorite comes from Julia Child, 
and it is it's quickly done and it is wonderful i worked at fedora on the plaza uh, when i started my apprenticeship and they had a giant pizza oven i don't know if you've ever if you ate at fedora but they were a giant pizza oven i think the, i think the pizza was only on the bar menu i don't think it was an entree but we served a ton of them and every night uh, we had a prep cook, wonderful guy, who came in. He did the pizza dough. And we, when we got ready for uh, really a slam holi Christmas holiday session there, we had a hundred little balls of the pizza dough ready to go. And it went on to the deck of a 600-degree pizza oven uh, and cooked right on the deck. And it was crisp, and it was delicious, and it was moist. It was a perfect thing well this is that good honestly this is that good a texture this that good a, a, of texture and um strength to hold up the pizza it's a wonderful dough and here we go how to make it this is just dump everything into the food processor go ahead please and the ingredients are nothing more than one package of yeast a half a cup of water a little bit of salt pretty important uh and then cold milk now the water that you're going to hide that you're going to uh, dissolve the yeast in uh, can't be over 110 you know tepid water and then um you you dump in the uh all-purpose flour not bread flour all-purpose flour and you dump all that stuff into the bowl of a food processor and it forms a bowl forms a ball Take it out, cut it in half, and you have enough dough there for two pizzas. Let it rest, and it and it will roll out easily. And you can put it on a peel, um, and slide it onto a pizza stone, and you will be surprised at how good that crust is with just the most simple ingredient toppings. It's wonderful. It's quick and easy. And it's well worth it. And if you have a, a, an outdoor grill, put your pizza or, or, or a, yes, a, a charcoal grill would be great or a gas grill. Put your pizza stone out there and do that out on the patio with your own pizza dough. It's a pretty nice substitute for one of those for one of those pizza ovens. I'd love to have a pizza oven, but I don't have the space or or the, the yard to do it. This is a good substitute in your own kitchen. And I use this pizza dough. I think the next slide is this. Well, oh, here, here it is. You see the ball that it forms and that, and that gets a rise that the, the pizza dough sits in that, in that ball until it doubles in size. It doesn't take much more than an hour. And if you put it in a warming oven, it, it can be a little less than an hour. So that's pretty quick. While you're getting all your ingredients together, the, the ball is rising. And then you can roll it out. Now, here's my trick. And I invented this. I made this up. I rolled them out. Put, putting a calzone or a pizza on a pizza peel with cornmeal is a big mess. It's a mess in your oven. It's a mess on the counters. It's just you're going to get the vacuum cleaner to clean up after after that so uh so instead of that i put my pizza rolled out pizzas or calzone in this case on parchment paper and i just picked it up like a hammock and put it on the pizza stone no peel involved and the the parchment paper was fine at 450 degrees and so i really recommend that for putting your pizzas. You now you can't go to a, like, you know, 12 inches or anything, but if you have 10 inch pizzas, or in this case, these are pretty heavy calzones on that parchment paper, it really worked well. Okay, go, go ahead. What is, uh, here's pizza margarita, uh, which is uh, my basil. <laughs> Just, oh boy, all you need is a three cheese pizza, especially if you make the crust yourself and then three really good cheeses. 
that you like. And then after it's with herbs, dried herbs, of course. And then as you serve it, put fresh basil leaves on it. That is pizza margarita. It's wonderful. It's it's not like the rich pizza, you know, sausage and pepperoni and all those kinds of rich meals where you eat two or three slices. That's it. This is a very light course with a salad, um, a couple of slices of, of pizza margarita is a very light meal. It's not that huge, overwhelming Chicago style pizza where you're getting 14 ounces of protein with your every every portion. This is this is very, very nice. I love pizza margarita. Okay, go ahead. That was a Jeopardy question the other day. Uh, here's my calzone. Again, it's Julius. And my ingredients, and I've showed you the ingredients before. I'll show them to you in just a minute. But this pizza is good. Hot, warm, cold. Just as good the next day as it is coming right out of the oven. This is a great dish. Not common. I don't know. Of course, I, I don't get out to the restaurants anymore, but I bet you you'd have a hard time finding a calzone in Kansas City tonight. But it's a wonderful dish. And especially with Julia's crust, and I put coarse salt over the top of that. This is just a delicious uh, American Italian uh, dish. And my ingredients for this are, are Julia's. Three cheeses and um, three kinds of cheese. And, and then peppers bell peppers, fennel, that Italian sausage that I showed you from Adele's that's already pre-cooked, rolled up in there and baked to brown. It's just a luscious meal. I always make this for a Super Bowl. Been making it for 30 years on for Super Bowl Sunday. Go ahead. So there's all the ingredients. I all the peppers, red and green peppers, the fennel, the onions are all steamed four or five minutes just to get them soft, a little soft. And the sausage I, that I used up there in the upper right hand corner of the left hand picture, it it was the pre cooked Adele's, and um, and since that crust is not gluten free, my portion of all the vegetables was. <laughs> Yeah, well, everybody else was enjoying calzone. I, I had the ingredients of the calzone, and that was a delicious meal. I'll tell you that. So I love that calzone recipe. It comes from Julia's fabulous, fabulous book. Uh, and, and I'll run around there and grab it here in just a minute because I can't remember which one it came from. But I think it's uh, I, can't, I just can't remember which one of the of the five Julia Child books I have that it comes out of. Okay, go ahead, please. Chicago style deep dish. I didn't know that I was going to be able to do this. Uh, during COVID, uh, my son took, took Chicago style deep dish pizza on, took him two days of, he had, he had to start with a starter. No one will tell you how to make a Chicago deep dish pizza. They will not they will not share that you can ask all the restaurants and you would think that all those Chicago restaurants that, that specialize in this would, would have mark, marketed how to do it in some way or another cooking schools or something. No. And America's Test Kitchen went, went to Chicago and they couldn't find anybody to help them with this thing, but they knew what it was supposed to be like. And if you haven't had a Chicago pizza, I, I, by the way, I, uh, I don't remember who was sitting at the table with us, but we took the culinary team, Lindy, uh, to Chicago one time, and we all went, of course, down to make sure that the students had a had a deep dish pizza. And oh, were they bored? Because you know, you go in there and order it, and like an hour later, it comes. It is forever waiting on that thing. The students were so bored, and they thought, oh, this is, you know, what are we doing here? But I insisted that we hang around to eat, get that great Chicago pizza experience. The crust is soft. It's surprisingly soft, and yet it's strong enough to hold this thing up. The Chicago pizza weighs 
three or four pounds. It's the heaviest thing you've ever seen. Guy hands it to you at the hotel in a, in a thing. You will, you will drop it probably. Uh, it's so surprising how thick, how heavy with meat and cheese it is. And so I did these in a nine inch baking pan and I used the test kitchen dough. It was great. And I had it all done in a couple of hours. A really great experience. Chicago pizza, they'll tell you it's all about the ingredients. It's not. It's all about the crust. It's got to be tender, yet strong. I'll tell you the texture that you want in a Chicago pizza is like a biscuit. Surprising. But that's legitimate. And really, this was good. This was good and doable. And the way it becomes doable, go ahead to the next slide, please, Jonathan. The way it becomes doable is that you use instant yeast. My son was doing this, starting with a starter for crying out loud, you know, 12 hours or 24 hours or something and bubbling around. No, 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 instant yeast. And, and then put it in a stand mixer because you'd have to be Popeye to do this by hand. So stand mixer, and use nine inch cake pans. The test kitchen says dark ones. I didn't have any. So I used those nine inch cake pans right there. That was wonderful. And what's well, so the sauce is the sauce, Lydia's sauce, Lydia's marinara. And uh, so I really, I think I really made a legitimate Chicago style crust. I've got that recipe in the, in the, uh, recipe pack. You'll be making your own Chicago style uh, pizzas. Uh, two of them by this recipe. And uh, okay, very good. Julia Child did this show back in the day on PBS, where she made a French style of lasagna. And she really rocked the culinary world. She was she really did it. She she belittled lasagna. She called it peasant food. She didn't add any garlic to it, surprisingly. I don't know whether she forgot it or blew it off. I don't know. It was it, what we would call today fusion cuisine because she incorporated a French velouté. She incorporated some very unusual uh, uh, vegetables. Uh, broccoli, asparagus, that sort of thing. And she used chicken. I mean, she turned lasagna upside down. And I've been making it for 30 years. I love it so. But you can't, I, I did not include this recipe in, in the recipe packet. It, you can find it uh, anywhere online. Julia's lasagna a la Francais. <laughs> Makes me laugh to even say it. But if you invite people over for lasagna and you serve on this, they'll be mad. They will be angry. They will, you will make them, they won't invite you back for dinner because it is so, it's not lasagna that you're looking for or that you could get at Casconi's or, <laughs> or any other restaurant in Kansas City that serves Italian American cuisine. This is an unusual one, but I love it. And I use it to, to talk about lasagna noodles and so forth. So let's look at let's look at what Julia did. Uh, okay, so first off, the lasagna noodles don't have to be pre-cooked. Don't forget about that. Just line them up on the bottom. Do you put them on the bottom or do you put sauce on the bottom? Well, I'll show you a little bit later why I always put lasagna down first on the pan so that it, there's a base when you or, or get lifting it up to put it on the plate. So I think it only makes sense to put the lasagna on the bottom. Look at the ingredients I have. Some lightly uh, cooked broccoli, some diced cooked chicken. I've got three sauces, uh, three sh uh, cheeses there, the, the typical ones, mozz. Uh, I think I have Parmesan in there. And I think I, I went to my favorite Gruyere. 
I have ricotta, not to everyone's taste. Don't add too much until you decide you like it. Uh, lightly, light hand with the with the ricotta cheese. Um, there's the, there's a the sauce. I use it, uh, the Lydia sauce for everything I did this week. And then at the bottom thing shows you a velouté. When, when I cooked the chicken, I made the stock, or let's say broth. And then um, I made uh, I made a thickened bio roux. I made that velouté that was a chicken flavored uh, velouté. So then I build the lasagna in the layers um, and uh, oiled pan. Uh, be sure to put it on a on a cookie sheet or a sheet pan because it's going to make a mess in your oven if you don't. Okay, next one, next slide, please. So. Here it is cooking in my version of a pizza oven. Uh, and you can't see it, uh, the, the pizza stone, but it's under that sheet pan. I just leave the pizza stone in the, in, uh, in the oven. It's always there. I put everything on top of the pizza stone for, for nice browning. Now, the top of the lasagna is going to, lasagna noodles are going to want to curl and be above the liquid. And if they do, they will be hard and crispy and you won't like, you won't enjoy that. So keep pressing them down and keep them down there in that liquid. Your very top layer for lasagna should be a lot of sauce. Well, I mean, of course, above that is cheese and garnish, but, but a lot of sauce over the top to keep those top noodles under the surface and keep them cooking and not and not uh, getting hard and crisp. Okay, next slide. So you do all that and it cooks and it sets up after about a half an hour. Uh, when it comes out of the oven, you try to slice it uh, before then. It won't have set. It won't cut nicely. So Plan that into your lasagna meal to make sure that the lasagna gets a long, long, long rest. And then you can cut and, and look how sharp I can cut it and get those portions. And you can see that the, that the uh, noodle on the bottom is the base. It's like pie crust, you know, it, it makes it so easy to serve that thing. That's Julia's uh, outrageous and uh, really, I mean, she was just hammered by the Italian American uh, audience and uh, for doing that. But it's brilliant quiz fusion cuisine, and I I love this dish. I just can't serve it to anybody who's expecting an Italian American experience with lasagna. Okay, next slide, please. Here's fettuccine and a brand that I had not used. I got this as a present again. I, I'm using all the things that I got for Christmas. I, my daughter found this. This It turns out that this is the most popular gluten-free pasta in Italy, which may be like saying, you know, the most uh, popular uh, sausage in, in, in Israel. Uh, but... Nevertheless, I think this brand is in every grocery store in Italy for those poor Italians who cannot eat flour. <laughs> I want to tell you, it is great. Corn pasta, for uh, it, it can be too corny, too sweet, too wrong. And this one was not. This one was just excellent taste, excellent to, to the taste tooth al dente. Oh, I love these little nests. Look, and we'll see how I did them next, next slide here. I got my great big old pan there. Um, actually, I didn't need to use such a big pan. It, it turns out about a six quart, maybe four quart. And um, got the water simmering, lowered those little nests in there, took took nine minutes as I remember. There's the meatball and uh, the meatballs that were cooked in, in spaghetti. And uh, so the, when the nests were done, I brought them out. I put them on the plate on the side here in the lower right-hand picture. You can see that I lined all, all of them up there on the, on the plate. And then before I served it, got the bowls hot, 
and I just put them right back in the in the simmering water, heated them up, dried them off a little bit, put them on the plate, put the meatballs and and, and sauce over the top of that fresh basil. Wow, that was that was a great Italian meal done very quickly with Lydia's marinara sauce, some pre-formed uh, nests of pasta and good Parmesan cheese over the top of that. I love fettuccine more than spaghetti or linguine because of the bite. If you, al dente is a different, I think I said it in one of the slides, it's, it's a personal thing. Uh, my wife wants absolutely no resistance whatsoever. But the way I cook these fettuccine, it was just so nice to chew the pasta and flavored with the cheese and the basil. Wow, it was delicious. One of the best Italian meals I've ever made. And I was so proud that, uh, that it turned out so well. And that those, those nests are so attractive. You know, big pile of spaghetti on a plate with some spaghetti spaghetti with some meatballs and, and red sauce over it. That's not a very attractive plate, but you can do that with these nests. We always made nests when we were serving pasta for, for big banquets. Um, we would we would uh, cook the pasta, oil it, season it, twist it into little nests on parchment paper, and then we would warm them up in the steamer. And that's how we were able to do pasta for a crowd. No, no, you know, trying to get the pasta out of a big bowl and wrap it or anything. No, no, all done ahead of time. That's what this is. And it made the, made the presentation so easy and quick. And I, I love this. I love those nests. And that I'll look for that brand from now on because it is really legitimate. Uh, go ahead, please. Two uh, wines here. I'm, I'm recommending two wines here to go with all of your Italian cuisine. I hope I hope I got you real interested in in having some Italian food. And you'll want to you'll want a Chianti. I'm sure you'll want a Chianti, a Classico. This is a now. I made a mistake on this slide. This Chianti is you can't find it. And nobody in town is going to have this Chianti. It is, it is so highly respected. It has the highest certifications to be legitimately from the Chianti region. And it gets a Wine Spectator 92. I know it says 94, not, not true. It gets a Wine Spectator 92. That's pretty good. Costs 40 bucks if you can find it. On the other hand, next slide, please. Here is a Wine Spectator 94. I reversed them. I know. 20 bucks. But it can't call itself a Chianti Classico. Comes from outside the region or done by some other process or a little mix different. Wine Spectator says, drink this wine for 20 bucks. Don't drink that $40 stuff. You can't find either one of these now in this particular year. This was, I don't know. I think these are about four years old. And so what I want to say about Chianti Classico is if you insist on Chianti Classico from the with the very highest four letters, whatever the heck they are, you're going to pay an arm and a leg, but it is not going to be a better quality wine than Italians make in adjacent regions. So go to a reference like Wine Spectator to rate and go for the go for the rating of taste and color and all those things that they rate. You you'll get a better uh, wine experience. I grew up with that cheap Chianti. I mean, it was terrible, but we just always drank it. We thought we had to have Chianti. Finally, we. Finally, we started insisting on Chianti Classico. And then finally, we just started buying Valpolicelli because we couldn't get a good Chianti. 
it was always in the reserve section, you know, and they're too crazy expensive. So we we settled on on Valpolicelli's until these Rufinos came along. And now they're very reasonably priced, always available and good wine. <laughs> okay, there you go. They don't have the wicker or whatever that was around the bottle, but they really do drink well. Let's see, let's see what the next one is. I can't wait to see because I don't know. Ah, <laughs> I spent a whole day cleaning my grill. I got this grill uh, when I retired uh, and got the Airstream and uh, Lindy sent me on, on my way. <laughs> Uh, camping across the country and I got this little gas grill to go in the back of the truck and it this this gas grill it is it is cooked for me uh, uh, at every national park I think that we were able to to get into it's just a killer little grill it's called a baby Q Weber has been making it forever and still makes it um and it's out on my driveway uh, to one or two nights a, a week in the winter and three or four nights a week in the summer. And um, I have a big, big charcoal smoker and all that stuff. That's a big production. But to just run out there and cook hamburgers, wow, it does a great job. If it's clean, the grates just build up and build up and build up. So I'm telling you, if you if you're not the grill master in your family, just walk out in the garage, open the lid of your spouse's grill. And if it's not doesn't look like bare metal, then tell him you learned a trick from John Head. And that is spend the day, get get a, a wire brush. I'm not talking about one of those little brass soft wire brushes that they sell, you know. Uh, to go along. I'm talking about a paint removing steel brush. You would think it would ruin the grate. It does not. You get this thing fired up after about an hour and a half or two hours and scrape and scrape and scrape. And then another hour or two of highest heat possible and scrape and scrape and scrape until it looks like bare metal put a very light coat of oil on it. And the next thing, and, oh, and another secret is wipe down the lid of your gas grill and get that creosote off of there. Creosote is the nastiest thing. It is, it just ruins barbecue. And um, you've got to wipe it out of the top. It builds up slowly. It's just like tar. And oh my, it makes things so badly flavored. So I got these, by, by mistake, I got these really great hamburgers. I ordered just our regular quarter pound hamburger patties and they didn't have them and they substituted these. And I think it was ground chuck. They were pretty big. They were like five ounces or something. And this was after that whole day of cleaning my gas grill. I used some Montreal steak seasoning on those hamburgers. I'm telling you, they were they were luscious. They were delicious. They were flat. They they were so good on a gas grill. No smoke or anything. They were just so delicious, all because my grates were clean. And so, and the creosote was gone. And I, so, I I recommend it. It's a it's a long afternoon of. Uh, of uh, burning this thing off and, and the smoke that comes out to, until you can get your grate back to bare metal. That's the standard. And after you cook, every time after you cook, burn your gas grill grates off for, the Weber says 10 minutes, that won't do it. You're gonna have to burn them off until all of that stuff will come off with, with, a, uh, with a brush. And, uh, Watch your brass brushes, the soft ones, they're gold colored, because you will see that they will leave those little wires behind on the grate. Be careful about that. There's, those things are dangerous. Uh, if, you're not, if you don't really look carefully, you're gonna be serving your guests those little brass wire 
filings from the brush. Let's see, I think the next slide is my contact information. I want to, I want to thank you all for being with me during this series. This, this will be the last one that we'll do in this format. Uh, and we'll, we'll have to decide, uh, Lindy and Jonathan and I and others that uh, have to decide wh where we go from here, but we won't do the monthly ones uh, from, from now on. So thank you for, for uh, bearing with me and it's been a pleasure. Any questions for John before we, we close down? I just want to say, John, um, I think I know a lot about cooking also, but I learned so much watching your sessions and it's just wonderful. Take notes and all your little tips. Um, I have just thoroughly enjoyed your session. 